that. Today, we're going to talk a little bit about a guy named Levi. And Levi changes his mind in the blink of an eye. And you know, sometimes it's really easy to change your mind. Other times, it's really hard to change your mind because there are certain things that are really important and valuable to you. My little son, Knox, he just turned one uh, last March. He's hilarious. And you guys, for those of you who are parents, you guys know that your kids, um, they can change their minds really quick about stuff. Well, you know, kids, they, they kind of like, you know, sense and see with their, with their eyes. And so when I try to feed him, if it doesn't look very good, he doesn't want to eat it. But if it looks tasty, I mean, he is so aggressive with how he eats food. He just doesn't take a bite and closes his mouth. His mouth, I'm not even going to do it because I don't want to make myself look stupid. His mouth goes open as wide as it can get. And then when he clamps down on the food, it's like a fish clamping down on a worm. And then he rips his head away and he marches around and it's two steps in. He comes back and he goes, more, more. And I'm like, dude, no, you haven't even swallowed what you got. Swallow what you have and I'll give you more. But he just wants to eat all of my food all the time. Well, I made some butter and jelly toast the other day. And I love butter and jelly toast. If you've never eaten butter and jelly toast, you really haven't lived. But I tried to give him some food. Well, he wasn't going to have it. Butter and jelly toast is delicious, and I know he'd love it. So I'm like, here, Knox. Well, of course, he kept shaking his head, and so I try to give him another bite. He doesn't want any. Finally, I kind of like pin him against my legs. Parents, you know what I'm talking about. And I pry <laughs> open his mouth, and I stick the piece of butter and jelly toast in, and he doesn't want it. And then all of a sudden, he goes, mmm. And for the next 30 minutes, he's like chasing after me, wanting more. Absolutely hilarious. Change his mind just like that. There are other times when it takes a little bit longer to change our minds. For me, I tend to change my mind pretty quickly. Um, there are some things that I struggle changing my mind about, but I'm going to confess a sin to you this morning where I changed my mind really quickly. So don't judge me too harshly, okay? I had a road raid incident once, and I'm ashamed to say that I had a road rage incident, and I'm laughing because that's how I deal with negative energy. Uh, so you can imagine what it's like to get in an argument with me, you know, if you were married to me. I smile, which isn't a good thing. So anyways, I'm smiling now because looking back at it, it was kind of funny. But I had a road raid incident when one night I went to get some Starbucks. I was really, really tired. And the Starbucks that I went to was in the circumference of a parking lot. So you didn't just pull into the Starbucks. You pulled into a, spark, a parking lot. There are a bunch of other stores in there. And then you navigated your way to the Starbucks. So I got my drink. It was late at night. And I go to pull out of the Starbucks. Well, there are two separate entry points where, you know, public traffic comes in. And so I do what any normal human being would do. I look left, I look right, I look left, I look right, and then I go ahead and, and, and pull it out. And from my perspective, what I saw, the people who were entering the parking lot were at least 50 yards away. So I had plenty of time. So I decided to pull left. Well, next thing I know, this guy comes flying past me in a parking lot, comes flying past me, this close to hitting me. He's in oncoming traffic. Other cars are getting ready to come uh, past me. And he almost hit me, I, and immediately, you guys know what I'm talking about, because most of you have probably been there yourself. I got angry, and I yelled, slow down! Absolutely ridiculous. Well, he yelled back. He said, pull over. I said, all right, let's do it. And so, <laughs> and so I pull over. I'm about 50 feet from him. And I jump out of the car. I've got my black sweatpants on, black boots, black T-shirt, because I had went to the gym a few hours earlier. And I am so angry. And he gets out of the car. And something changed in me like that. And I don't really know what it was. It could have been the fact that he was about 6'5", 350 pounds, <laughs> with dreadlocks hanging down to the, the middle of his back. And I went, did you think I cut you off? <laughs> I totally wimped out, changed my mind that fast. He goes, yeah, I felt like you cut me off. Well, I'll tell you how the story ended a little bit later. But in that moment, I changed my mind really quick. <laughs> I don't know if you have a similar story, and I'm ashamed that I was so angry in that moment, but God has a way of humbling us throughout our life situations. And that's exactly what we're going to find today in Luke chapter 5 with a guy named Levi. Levi, a little bit of background about this passage of scripture. Levi encounters this guy named Jesus who's been traveling along the wayside, teaching and preaching the gospel. Jesus has just begun his ministry. 
And so Jesus has some of his first divine healings, right? He heals this man that's paralyzed. He heals another person who's got leprosy. So he's got this infectious disease that you just can't get rid of. And, and, and he, Jesus encounters these guys named the Pharisees. Now the Pharisees, a little bit about them. The Pharisees are considered the religious elite of the day. They are the guys who have the power and the influence because they were viewed as the most holy guys walking. I mean, everybody would separate through the streets when they saw the Pharisees coming by. That's the kind of respect and the kind of power and influence that these guys had over the people. Well, the Pharisees, a little bit more information about the Pharisees. The Pharisees were so holy because they developed certain regulations, certain laws, a thousand, over a thousand of these rules and regulations that prevented them from violating God's word. So they had this deep love for God's word and this deep love for righteousness. And in that love, they thought, well, you know what? So we won't end up violating God's law. Let's create all of these other traditions, all of these other rules and regulations that prevent us from even getting close to violating God's law. And so one turned into two, two turned into three, and next thing you know, you have this entire list of rules and regulations that nobody can keep at all, let alone the Pharisees. They are so bad that they, the Pharisees who created these laws, can't even keep these rules and these regulations. And so the Pharisees got really passionate about loving God's law and protecting themselves from unrighteousness to the point where they did things that were not good and they were unloving to the people around them. They were, what we see in the scriptures, by all means of the word, hypocrites. And so here is Jesus healing people, loving people, preaching the word, and the Pharisees stand back with their arms crossed and they're wagging their fingers at Jesus, and they start right from the beginning to accuse Jesus of blasphemy. So Jesus teaches the gospel, he rebukes the Pharisees, and he leaves the scene with their jaws hanging down as far as they could because of the type of power and healing and testimony that he gave. And if you turn to Mark chapter 2, which I don't want you to, but Mark tells us that after this interaction with the Pharisees, I know, I just want to tell you, after this interaction with the Pharisees, Jesus, uh, he went to the countryside. So he left the city, he went to the countryside, and he taught more people. And then after teaching the crowds, he dismisses them, and he goes for a walk along the boat docks, merchants coming and going, buying and selling, and he sees the guy that he's looking for, a guy named Levi. And Levi's sitting in a tax booth, and he's collecting taxes from his fellow Jewish men. Now, Levi was considerably one of the most hated people in all of his entire country. He was a Jew, but he was a tax collector. And he was considered somebody who had betrayed his people and betrayed his country because he would not only take money from a, a Roman opposition, right? He would take the Jewish money to fund the Roman opposition, but he would charge his fellow countrymen double, triple, four times as much as what they were due, and he would take all of that money and he would pocket it. And so he became a very wealthy man and a very hated man. Day in and day out, every year, tax, double tax, stealing, manipulation, he was good at keeping records, he was good at writing things down, but yet in the midst of his occupation, he did things that were very, very evil. And Jesus looks at Levi in Matthew chapter 5, verse 27, and it says this, when he came to Levi, he said, follow me. Let's read it together. In verse 27, it says, after that, after Jesus' interaction uh, with the Pharisees, he went out and noticed a tax collector named Levi sitting in the tax booth, and he said to him, follow me. I think this is a really important part of Scripture, and at first it might seem um, like it doesn't really matter. But remember, this is the most despised man in the entire country of Judea. He's hated. He's rejected. It would be like this, right? If there was a FBI agent who was exposed as a, uh, a Russian spy, and he was, he was called out. It would be like us going and ministering to that man and saying, hey, come be a part of us. And for those of us who, who are patriots, we love God, we love our country, we have a lot of people who are in the military, a lot of people who work for government in here. I mean, just imagine that kind of tension in your own heart and in your own mind. Somebody who has betrayed everything that you hold dear and valuable has become one of the most greatest respected people to Jesus because he says, come, follow me. Or think about a prostitute. Think about somebody who is a sex slave, walking up to somebody like that and say, hey, I want to disciple you in Jesus' name. I want you to come to church, and I want you to serve with us. 
Now, if you don't feel that tension, I don't know what else I could share with you to get you to feel that tension, but just imagine the worst person possible. And Jesus goes after this guy, and he says, Levi, follow me. Here's what that means for you and I. God is willing to call the worst of us. God is willing to call the worst of the worst. People who have betrayed their country, people who have committed murder. Maybe you're like Levi and committed fraud and manipulation and extortion. I'm not sure what it is that you've struggled with, but when you think of yourself, and you're like, man, sometimes I just don't feel very good about myself. The good news is that if God and Jesus were willing to call Levi, he's willing to call you and I. Another thing that this means is that God loves Levi. God loves Levi enough in order to see through his sin and his mistakes, and he is willing to call Levi into himself. And that means this, if God is willing to call somebody like Levi into his service, he's willing to call you and me into his service. And that's really, really good news. God loves us. He wants a relationship with us. That's one of the reasons why Paul wrote in 1 Timothy chapter 2, verse 4, look what it says. God desires all men to be saved and to come to the knowledge of the truth. Look what Peter wrote in 2 Peter chapter 3. God is patient towards you, not wishing for any to perish, but for all to come to repentance. And so here, Jesus sees Levi, just like God sees you and I in our corrupt state. And he says, follow me. I want a relationship with you. And that's why Paul was able to write in Romans 5, 8, God demonstrates his love towards us and that while we were sinners, Christ died for us. Here's Matt, not Matthew, here's Levi. I kind of ruined it for you. Erase that out of your mind, okay? It's not Matthew, it's Levi. But here's Levi sitting in a tax booth being called to follow after Jesus. And here you and I are in our worst state. God sees us at our worst and he's willing to send his son to die for us. That should mean a lot to people like you and me. And so we find Levi in Luke chapter 5, verse 28, and it says this, and he left everything behind and he got up and began to follow him. Levi said, I'm going to leave it all. And this moment he was transformed. He was willing to leave his job, his occupation. He was willing to leave his sinful practices of extortion and manipulation. And he was willing to drop everything and go follow after Jesus. I hope that you and I could have the kind of encouragement to follow Jesus like Levi. You see, truth faith expresses itself in obedience. One person says, hey, look, I'm a Christian. I follow after Jesus. But yet their life doesn't reflect the confession that they have. True faith expresses itself in following after Jesus. And Levi is willing to drop it and leave it all and say, I'm following this guy. And he knew the stakes. He knew what it would be, um, how much it would cost him to follow after Jesus. And Jesus made it crystal clear. He made it crystal clear to Levi, and he makes it crystal clear to you and I. Look at what he says in Matthew chapter 16, verse 24. He says, if anyone wishes to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Levi had the luxury. He had the silver and gold. He had the power and position and influence. And he knew what it was going to cost him to follow after Jesus. Again, and Jesus said in Matthew 10, 22, he says, you're going to be hated by all people because of me. It costs a lot to follow Jesus sometimes. There are people in this room who have been disassociated from their family because they've decided to follow after Jesus. There have been people who have lost their jobs, who have given up friends, family, who have given up money, power, position, influence, just like Levi. There are people in this room who have given up a lot in order to follow after Jesus. Everybody in this room who proclaims to follow Christ has given up something. Your sin, your ambition, your future, whatever it is, we know that it costs a lot. And Levi, Levi knows this. He understands it. And yet he's willing to drop everything and follow after Jesus. You know, I can't help but laugh um, when I look at, at Levi and just his reckless abandonment because he was relentless in following after Jesus. It didn't matter. He was willing to give it all up. And I look at myself and I chuckle because, you know, when I think of somebody like Levi, I'm like, wow, this guy made a lot of sacrifice. And I think about myself and sometimes I'm like, man, have I really given that much? Have I really, has it really cost me a lot to follow Jesus? Has it cost me my job? No. Has it cost me my family? No, not necessarily. What about my friends? No, they still want to be my friends and I'm still their friends my reputation, my position, my power, my influence. And there may be something that God is asking you to give up this morning, just like Levi. Whatever it is, here's the main point. 
it will be worth it. Later on in the Gospels, Matthew tells us about Peter. There had been a man that came to Jesus. He was a rich young ruler. And he comes up to Jesus and he says, Jesus, I have followed the law completely. What else do I need to do in order to follow you? And this is what Jesus told him. Sell all of your possessions and give them to the poor. Now, I'm not advocating for you to do that, okay? Jesus doesn't ask all of us to sell everything that we have and give it all to the poor in order to follow him. But in this circumstance, the problem with the rich young ruler was that he loved money. He loved his possessions. That was the thing for him that prevented him from following after Jesus. And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says he went away sad. He was sad. Why? Because he didn't want to give up his stuff. He didn't want to let go of his money. He loved his money more than he loved God. So yeah, he followed the Ten Commandments, fine. But when it came to his heart, his true sin was revealed. And Jesus turned to his disciples and he said this, it is hard for a rich man to enter the kingdom of God. And they were shocked. They were shocked. Why were they shocked? Because they thought being a disciple of Jesus, the Messiah, he was going to give them everything. Position, political power, money. They were going to be sitting in Jerusalem, reigning over the nations for as long as they would, as long as God allowed them. They were going to be given everything. And Jesus turned, he turned the tables and he said, look, it is hard for a rich person to enter the kingdom of God because of how much they love their money. And Peter, man, God bless Peter, because he's a lot like me. Sometimes he just, he's, you know, you ever meet a person that they should just stick their foot in their mouth and they always say something before thinking? Sometimes it's a lot like me. You guys know because you listen to me every Sunday. And so here is Peter, devastated, because he had all of these ideas of what it would be like to be a follower of the Messiah, and they come crashing down in this moment. And he asked Jesus this question in Matthew chapter 19, verse 27. He says, Jesus, what is there going to be for us? We have left everything to follow you, and we're supposed to get all of this stuff, and now you're saying we're not going to get it. They were devastated, not just Peter, but also the rest of the, rest of the disciples. And look at Jesus' response. This is so important. Jesus says in verse 28, Truly I say unto you that you who have followed me and the regeneration when the Son of Man will sit on his glorious throne, you also shall sit on the twelve thrones, judging the twelve tribes of Israel, and everyone not just disciples, everyone who has left houses, brothers, sisters, father or mother or children or farms for my name's sake will receive many times as much and will inherit eternal life. But many who are first will be last and the last will be first. Peter's worried because he's going to lose these things that are temporary. But Jesus says, look, it's going to get a whole lot better. What you are sacrificing now is not worth comparing to the future joy that's going to be revealed. And Levi saw that. That's what enabled him to make that sacrifice. That's what enabled him to give up everything and gain Jesus, is that he saw the future joy. And if you and I are going to be true followers of Jesus, there are going to be things that we have to give up. There are going to be things that we have to sacrifice. But the message should ring true to us. There is a future joy that awaits us that isn't worth comparing to what we sacrifice now. And for Levi, it was worth giving up. And that's the same thing for you and I. So what caused Levi to leave everything behind? It was this future joy. And look at what Levi, do, look what Levi does in Luke chapter 5, verse 29. And Levi gave a big reception for him in his house. How many of you, if you lost your job in Jesus' name, for Jesus' sake, you'd throw a party? Many of us, if we don't get the promotion that we want, we go into three months of depression and we don't want to work there anymore. But yet he gave up his job to follow after Jesus and he throws a big reception and a party. And look what it says. It says, and there was a great crowd of tax collectors and other people who were reclining at the table with them. Levi demonstrates true faith. How do we know he demonstrated true faith? He repented. He changed his mind about his sin. He changed his mind about his situation. He changed his mind about a circumstance. And he got up and he followed after Jesus. How do we know that he repented? He acted. He acted upon his changed mind. You know, a lot of people, when I talk to them about repentance, I say, hey, what's repentance? And they say, well, it's admitting to God the things that you've done wrong. And I say, no, that's confession. Repentance is to change your mind about your sin, about your situation, and to follow after Jesus. And a lot of us, we get the first part right. We say, look, I don't want to sin. I don't want to do that anymore. But when it comes to following Jesus into the houses of tax collectors and sinners, that may be a struggle with us. That may be something that's difficult. 
It's hard to follow Jesus where he tends to go in the world and in ministry. But that's what true repentance is. Changing your mind about your sin and your situation and following after Jesus. And that's what Levi was willing to do. As I said earlier, I kind of let it slip. I wanted it to be a surprise if you didn't know. But Levi is also called Matthew. This is the kind of transformation that Levi went through. The worst of the worst. He was a manipulator and somebody who extorted people, his own countrymen, out of their money. And he was called to follow after Jesus. He became one of the 12 disciples and he wrote the gospel of Matthew. You want to talk about a transformation. You look at somebody like Levi and you are just shocked at what God can do with a person. And that is so encouraging to me because a lot of us, we look at Levi and we're like, we've never done bad stuff like that before. And that's good news because God can use people like you and me. And God took what, what Levi was good at. Levi was good at keeping records. He was good at writing. And so what does God do with a person like that? Have, have him write the Gospel of Matthew. And at the beginning of the Gospel of Matthew, we find one of the greatest things that is ever in historical documents. It's a last lineage of Jesus. It's the last known lineage of Judaism that we have. Jesus is the last known documented Jew that we actually have evidence for. And Matthew gave it to us because of his skills and his abilities. You want to talk about a transformation. Levi is somebody who has been transformed. He went from being the worst of the worst to one of the greatest servants in the kingdom of God. And he celebrated this transformation with Jesus. He throws this banquet. He probably got bread and fish and vegetables, and cakes, and wine, and he gathers all of his friends together, fellow tax collectors, sinners, people who are the outcasts of Israel, and he says, look guys, I want to celebrate my transformation with you. And this is what's so incredible, is that leaving behind his old life created a new love for his friends. He wanted to share it. Now, I'm not telling you that you need to get rid of your friends. Even though the Bible does say bad company corrupts good character, basically what that means is if you start to be influenced by the evil influencers around you, you need to cut it off. But here, Matthew, Levi, is in a position to influence his friends. And so he invites them and he says, come celebrate. And man, I wish I could be there. Can you imagine what it would be like to hear the testimony of Matthew, Levi, in the midst of his friends, fellow tax collectors and sinners? people who were hated, I would have loved to have been there to hear Jesus share the gospel message as he ate and dined with them. Can you imagine what that would be like? How much hope that would give to Matthew and the people around him? And that's exactly what's going on. Look, true repentance is not just reflected in obedience. It's reflected in celebration. I think that we should follow Levi in the path of repentance. As we saw in verse 27, Jesus says, come follow me. And he says that same thing to you and I. One of my favorite passages of scripture is in Hebrews chapter 12. Paul's encouraging a church, a group of people who have been hated and persecuted by their fellow Jewish men. They've been robbed. Their houses have been taken from them, repossessed. They've been thrown in jail. And they are finally at their breaking point where they're like, look, this is, I don't know if this is worth it. And so they're willing to go back to Judaism because the, the persecution is so tough. And look what Paul says in Hebrews chapter 12. He says, let us lay aside every encumbrance and sin which so easily entangles us and let us run with endurance the race that is set before us. Levi was sitting at a tax booth and Jesus said, come follow me. And he left everything. You and I are seen by God at our worst and God says, come follow me. What is it that you have to leave behind? What is it that you are still holding on to and clinging to that's preventing you from following God the way that you know you should? Is it a sex addiction? Is it the love of money? Is it power and position and image on social media and influence? Are you afraid you're going to lose your friends? Are you afraid you're going to lose your job? What is it that is laying a barrier before you in front of Jesus? And notice what he says. He doesn't just say, lay aside every sin. What does he say? Lay aside every encumbrance and sin that prevents you from running the race set before you. And so a person who follows Levi in the path of resistance, uh, repentance doesn't just say, is it a sin? Should I get rid of this because it's a sin? A person who has true repentance says, does it help me run? Does this thing get in my way from becoming more holy, more gentle, more kind, more loving of God and of people? Does it slow me down and trip me up? Not just, is it a sin? 
So when we look at Levi, look at what Levi did. He laid aside his sins, absolutely. He even laid aside his job because he knew his job slowed him down, prevented him from following after Jesus. Now again, I'm not saying that you've got to write your letter of resignation this afternoon. What I am saying is that there are things that are preventing you from following after Jesus. And if you really are wanting to repent, change your mind about your sin and your situation and following after Jesus, there are going to be things that you have to sacrifice And so Paul encourages us, like Levi, lay these things aside. Does it help me run? Now, why should we lay these things aside? What helps us lay these things aside? Well, we should lay these things aside because Jesus is the greatest. And your life will be so much better for it. But what's going to push you through when you don't feel like Jesus is worth it is future joy. It was the future joy that caused Levi to lay his sins and his situation aside and follow after Jesus. It was future joy that caused Peter and the rest of the disciples to lay their sin and their situation aside and follow after Jesus. And it's going to be future joy that pushes us through as well. Look at what Paul goes on to say in verse 2. He said, We should fix our eyes on Jesus, the author and perfecter of faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. What caused Jesus to endure the cross for you and me? It's future joy. What's going to cause us to endure our sacrifice in order to follow Jesus? It's future joy. And so we can boldly say the same thing that Paul wrote in Romans 8, 18. Our present sufferings are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed in us. And what you are sacrificing now, your money, your time, your job, your influence will be worth it. Your repentance is worth it. It was worth it for Levi. He never changed his mind, wrote the gospel of Matthew, sacrificed his own life to follow Jesus, as well as the other disciples, and it will be worth it for you as well. And so here we have Levi's story, telling us a message of God's love that reaches to the worst of us, and Jesus is willing to use us if we are willing to follow him and change our minds about our sin, lay them aside, and follow after Jesus. Levi's story tells us that our present sacrifices are worth it. It's worth the future joy. But you know what? You are always going to have naysayers. You're always going to have negative Nancys and people are always going to try to discourage you because even though God looks past your sin and he sees your potential, you are always going to have people who are going to look at you at your worst and want to keep you there. And that's the same thing we find in the rest of the story. Look at Luke chapter 5 verse 30. It says, the Pharisees, who of course were there at this banquet, and the scribes began grumbling at the disciples saying, why do you eat and drink with the tax collectors and sinners? And Jesus answered and said unto them, It is not those who are well who need a physician, but those who are sick. And I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Why are the Pharisees upset? Why are they grumbling? Why are they standing on the outside looking in saying, Jesus, look at him. Eating with those tax collectors, those sinners, not worthy of be calling righteous. And he claims to be a rabbi. All the rules and regulations hardened their heart to the point where they couldn't love people anymore. And that will be the same thing that is true for you and I if we should err on the path of legalism. Yet, we may have good intentions, that we love God and we want to follow him. And so we've created these rules to restrict our liberties and the liberty of people around us. But if we continue to build up laws and regulations that aren't found in the Bible, we will find ourselves loving these things more than people. Let me ask you a question. When's the last time you sat down with a group of of sinners and shared the love of God with them, shared your story? Has your opportunity passed you by at work, in your community? Have you been more preoccupied with things that are going on in the church, rules, regulations, things you don't like, or are you actually out loving God and loving people by following Jesus to the worst of the worst at the worst places? I think that's a challenge that we all need to ask ourselves this morning. We need to think about as we leave here, have we spent more time being like the Pharisees from the outside looking in, sitting on the sidelines, grumbling and complaining and casting the stones, being upset at the transformation of other people, or have we actually sat beside Jesus with the tax collectors and the sinners showing people God's love? And so the Pharisees, they're upset. 
They're upset because not just the rules and the regulations, but because Jesus is sending a very loud and clear message. And in those times, if you sat down and ate with someone, it was almost as if you approved their lifestyle. He said, it's okay what you're doing. But that's not what Jesus is doing at all. He's not condoning their sin. He's sharing the gospel message. He's sharing the goodness of God with them. And he is willing to go to the worst of the worst, regardless of his reputation. And the Pharisees can't stand it. You know, that's what I've noticed about New Testament liberty, is whenever you follow it, people who are obsessed with legalism can't stand the true grace of God. They despise it. And that's exactly what these guys are doing here. Here's the main problem. Their faulty thinking, their idea that I need to love rules and regulations more than people, it began with a good thought and a pure intention, but it eventually manifested itself in hatred. They weren't acting in love. They weren't doing things that are good. They thought they were doing things that were right, but they were unloving and they weren't very good to the people around them. You know, one of the most loving things that you can do is to eat with sinners and celebrate the change that God has made with you. It's one of the best things that you could do to love people. Go out and have a meal and spend time with people who don't believe in Jesus, who don't follow God, and share the change that God has made in you. And the Pharisees missed it. They completely missed it. And this is something that scares me because as a Christian, been in the ministry for 11 years, sometimes you can get so focused on things that don't matter that you forget the things that really do matter. Satan will plant distractions in your mind. He'll shoot those fiery darts to get you to go down a rabbit trail of things that are a waste of your time. They don't matter. And you haven't loved or, or served anyone. You haven't invited people into your home, but yet you get distracted with these things that are, are really a waste of your time. And so here's the deal. These Pharisees are so distracted because they've missed the heart of the gospel. And there are three reasons why. And I ask myself this question, how do I know if I'm missing it? Here's the first thing. We are missing it if we're more concerned about our traditions, our wants, and our preferences over leading the lost to repentance. Well, what will happen? What will happen in the eyes of the people around me at work if if I decide to eat with this person? What will people think of me if I actually invite somebody who's sexually immoral over to my house? What will people do if I invite people who get drunk and fornicate on the weekends? How will I be perceived? What if I'm friends with them on Facebook? You think Jesus cares about those things? Absolutely. But he cares about something more. And that's where the Pharisees missed it. They misplaced their priorities on things that mattered, just didn't matter the most. Following God's law is important, but not at the cost of creating rules and regulations which prevent us from loving people. How do we know if we're missing it? We're more focused on laws and regulations rather than people. Here's another way we know if we're missing it. We know that we are missing it if we hold on to things that are preventing us from loving God and loving people. And these could be sins. These could be things that you struggle with day in and day out, and you are holding on to them in such a way that has prevented you from sharing God's message with the people around you. Don't miss it. Here's another way you know if you're missing it. We are missing it if we grumble like the Pharisees. To grumble is to murmur indignantly in a low tone. And this is what the Pharisees were doing. This is ridiculous. Look at that. Look at this guy. Eating with tax collectors and sinners. They wouldn't walk up to Jesus, but they sat in the background murmuring and complaining and grumbling, but not doing anything about it. Guys, we are missing it if we sit on the sidelines and complain and we're not in the battle loving people and loving God. If we're not sitting at the dinner table with Jesus, sharing the good news (laughs) with tax collectors and sinners, we're missing it. I don't know about you, but I don't want to miss it. I don't want to stand there and shake my head because of my traditions and my preferences. I want to be there with Jesus. And notice what Jesus says in verse 32, and we're going to end with this. He says, I have not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. This is a very sarcastic response. Here's what he means. I'm not here for those of you who think you are healthy. I'm here for those of you who know you are sick. The doctor can't give you medicine until you recognize that you're sick and you're willing to go and get medicine from him. You can't get healed by Jesus until you realize that you're broken. And we all are broken. The question is, is whether or not we're going to go to him for the medicine that we need. And so Jesus looks at the Pharisees, knows what they're grumbling and murmuring about, and he says, look, you guys think you're healthy. I'm not here for you. I'm here for them. And so he ate with them and he shared the gospel message message with them. 
And you know, I asked myself this question this week. What kind of doctor goes onto the battlefield as bullets are whizzing by to heal the men who have been shot in the midst of a battle? What kind of person does that? Or think about it like this. What kind of doctor is willing to go into a hospital or a tent where there are a bunch of contagious diseases at completely reckless abandonment? What kind of doctor is willing to go into a situation like that for the purpose of healing and loving people? Praise God for for doctors that are willing to do that, right? What kind of doctor would do something like that? I can tell you who. A person who loves. A person who loves. And that's what Jesus is willing to do. He's willing to go into, quote unquote, enemy territory to love people, to see people as they truly are, someone worth dying for. And that's the encouragement that I hope that you and I have. Look, we can have all the faith that we want to, but if that faith has not manifested itself in repentance, a change of mind, an attitude towards our sin, a change of mind, an attitude towards our situation, and a, and a following after Jesus, if our faith is not reflected in repentance, we cannot claim to have true faith. If our love doesn't follow Jesus where he goes to the worst of us, can you and I really claim to have true love? Jesus goes into the home of a tax collector, a sinner, the worst of the worst. Are you and I willing to follow Jesus there? That's the question. And so if Jesus' love sent him to love the worst in the worst places, God is sending us to love the worst in the worst places. Jesus came to call us. He says, look, I'm here. Why? To call you to repentance. Jesus came to call us in the world to repentance. And in case I haven't made it crystal clear, repentance is to change your mind about your sin, to leave those sins behind, and to follow after Jesus. It's like Levi, otherwise known as Matthew, who left behind the love of money, the sin of fraud, manipulation, and anything that tripped him up, including his job, and he chose to follow Jesus. And if we've truly repented, we will do the exact same thing. I admire a guy like Levi because he, he sacrificed a lot. And I started out the story about something that I've done that I'm really not proud of, but it's funny looking back now because I totally wimped out. Uh, if you could have only seen my face and felt what I felt when I saw that guy step out of the car, you would have probably laughed for a very long time. And so I asked him in a cracked voice, you know, did you feel like I cut you off? And he said, yeah. And I said, well, I'm sorry. And we, start, we kept walking at each other. And I'm not talking about a casual, leisurely walk. I'm talking about aggressiveness. And, uh, and I said, you know, well, I'm sorry. He goes, man, I've just had a, a, a rough day. And we literally hugged each other in the parking lot. Isn't that weird? I mean, can you imagine seeing two guys ready to fight each other? And the next thing you know, they're hugging each other. But that's what we did. Now, I could have got out, just, you know, had short man syndrome and been ready to fight this guy. But I realized in the midst of my wrong, I realized that fighting a a big guy like that wasn't worth it. And I really had an outburst of anger. And it's amazing what God can do with people who are willing to change their mind and change it quick. God wants to embrace you. And I can promise you this, you go up against a battle with God, you're not going to win. You'll lose every time. But God isn't a bully who's wanting to punish you. He's a savior who's willing to die for you. He wants to come into your home He wants to eat with you and fellowship with you and share the good news with you. And he wants you to do that same thing with the people around you. You know, the the same question that was asked on the day of Pentecost. (laughs) Levi probably asked Jesus the same thing, the same thing that the rich young ruler who went away sad asked. He said, what shall I do? In Acts 2.37, that's what they asked on the day of Pentecost when Peter preached the gospel message. This Jesus, whom you crucified, God has made both Lord and Christ. And they were convicted to the heart. They were like me. They realized they were wrong. (laughs) And Peter responded, repent. Change your mind about your sins and your situation. Follow after Jesus. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of your sins and the gift of the Holy Spirit. And God wants to embrace us. But if you're not willing to recognize that you're ill and you need medicine from the master, he can't help you. And so that's what I want to encourage you to do. Let's stand and let's pray.